because the Scottish government uh, made a tactical mistake. Uh, I mean, a little bit of uh, immediate past history here. The Scottish Parliament is a fixed-term parliament sitting for four years, the current one for five, elected by proportional representation. So that was designed so that no one party should get a majority of seats. In the 2007 to 11 Parliament, the Scottish Nationalists, SNP, got the largest single number of seats and so they formed a minority government. As a minority government, they could quite safely propose to, propose to have a referendum on independence because they knew it would be voted down by the majority in that parliament. So they were doing what economists call a cheap talk gesture to their own supporters and they could then condemn the majority parties in opposition uh, for voting down their cheap talk gesture. That all happened. In 2011, to everybody's surprise, including the SNPs, they did win a majority of seats. Not a majority of votes, but a majority of seats. This bit was possible through some, if you will, defects or features in the Scottish PR system. So they had to, um, they couldn't now say, oh, well, now we have a majority of seats, we didn't really mean it. They, had, they were trapped into their referendum promise. I don't think it, well, it's a pretty dumb thing to say, to be honest. Uh, nationalism, uh, if, you, if by nationalism you mean the assertion of Scottish identity and difference and specialness, you'll never kill that stone death, and nor should you try. Uh, the thing that we have to make a decision about is whether Scotland should become a separate state, whether it should break the political links of the Union uh, with England and the rest of the United Kingdom and become a state in its own, or whether it should continue to be part of what I would call a multinational state in the UK. Uh, that choice will be made in September. Uh, I wouldn't be uh, going to repeat uh, George's error by saying that's the end of Scottish nationalism or Scottish separatism. Of course it won't be. Uh, people who genuinely believe in it uh, will, will not uh, completely abandon it. But what is pretty clear is that the Scottish people will vote no. The issue is off the agenda for a pretty long time. Okay, so the franchise for the referendum is uh, those on the electoral register in Scotland, including 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, it doesn't include people of Scottish birth, such as me, outside uh, of Scotland, so I don't get a vote. Uh, should it have done? Well, that um, raises a whole host of questions. Um, I think the main question is, should the electorate of the whole UK have been invited to vote on this? Uh, and there's a strong argument to say that they should. But what would you do then if the majority of those uh, electors in Scotland said yes and the majority of those in the rest of the UK said no? Or indeed the converse, which is not inconceivable. If you get different answers in different parts of the country, what do you do with the results? And that's quite a difficult question. Well, citizenship uh, of any country depends on two characteristics. One. Uh, a physical characteristic, where are you in it, uh, where you, and were you born in it, or were your parents born in it. So in that sense, uh, citizenship has a, has a sort of ethnic uh, dimension. Uh, so what the Scottish Government are proposing in their white paper is more or less what one would have expected them to propose. That is to say, British citizens who are living in Scotland on Independence Day will automatically uh, be given Scottish citizenship. And anyone who was born in the territory of Scotland uh, may become a citizen, even though they were not resident uh, on Independence Day. And similarly, most likely, uh, anyone whose parents are citizens or eligible to be citizens would be able to become Scottish citizens. The interesting question, actually, is not what the Scottish government does in this context, but what the UK government does. Because, of course, people living in Scotland today are UK citizens. And the question is, would they be able to retain their UK citizenship? Uh, the UK has always, in fact, taken quite a relaxed attitude to dual citizenship. So the probability is that a UK government uh, would not deprive uh, UK citizens uh, of their Scottish citizenship. So people who uh, are living in Scotland could find they had Scottish citizenship forced upon them, if you like, uh, but they probably won't find 
that they have UK citizenship taken away from them. Well, the, the idea that the Scottish Government in an independent Scotland uh, could uniquely discriminate against students from the rest of the UK in charging them fees, but not other EU student fees, is so contrary uh, to basic European law uh, that it is deeply implausible. Uh, and this is an interesting quirk, actually. Um, for reasons uh, which might be good or might be bad, but are certainly popular, uh, the Scottish Government has pursued a policy of zero fees uh, for higher education. Um, this is not uniquely an SNP approach in that previous uh, Scottish governments had certainly uh, been in favour of lower fees or deferred fees, uh, but the SNP decided that the answer was zero fees. However, they continue uh, and can continue uh, to charge fees to students from elsewhere uh, in the rest of the UK, and Scottish universities charge uh, fees which are pretty well comparable uh, to what those students would pay if they went to a university in England or, or in Wales. Uh, and the uh, result of that is that the Scottish university sector gets a substantial slug of income uh, from the rest of UK students. It is probably around £150 million pounds a year, which is pretty significant uh, for the university's budget, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, so uh, if Scotland were to, were to become independent and to try to pursue uh, a zero fees policy, uh, there would undoubtedly be a hole in the budgets of Scottish universities. Most people agree that there are four choices on currency facing Scotland. Scottish Government's preference is to maintain sterling and be in a currency union with the rest of the UK. Then there's the option of which is variously called dollarization, sterlingization, or the Panama option, which is to continue to use sterling without asking anybody's permission. Thirdly, join the euro. Fourthly, independent Scottish currency. Uh, now, the UK government is very clear that option one is not going to happen. There's been some confusion around this because a still anonymous UK government minister uh, told the Guardian newspaper that oh, we were only bluffing uh, and that if the vote is yes, then the rest of the UK will allow Scotland to uh, join or remain in the pound. Uh, I think that minister, whoever it was, and we don't know, was just wrong. It is not in the interests of the rest of the UK to share a currency union with a foreign country. But even, even if it were to, it would be in a position to impose conditions on Scotland which would be so onerous that... Uh, Scottish voters will wonder why they agreed to this. So I think that is actually a non-starter. I also think, although the influential economist John Kay thinks differently, I think that the Panama option of continuing to use the pound without a formal agreement is a non-starter. Financial services are one of the biggest industries in Scotland. Uh, if they were uh, headquartered in a country that had no central bank, no lender of last resort, no effective deposit insurance scheme, they would go. And Bango is one of your largest sources of employment. So really, I think the options are euro or independent Scottish currency. Uh, Scottish government used to favour the euro, or the SNP used to favour the euro, for obvious reasons they're less keen on it now. Uh, their negotiations with the uh, EU might be awkward on this point because EU negotiators might say you have to ultimately commit to join the euro, but they can avoid that. Denmark has avoided it, Sweden has avoided it, uh, Czech Republic has avoided it. So uh, by elimination, I think the likeliest option is number four, separate currency. In a sense, membership of the European Union is a, something of a safety net uh, for those who argue for independence because they're able to say that if you are in the EU, many of the benefits that you get from membership of the UK come free. In particular, uh, the free movement of people uh, and the uh, freedom of trade, the single market. Uh, so in that sense, uh, EU membership has made independence a less radical 
and therefore less threatening and potentially therefore a more popular proposition. But of course that analysis uh, rests on several assumptions. Uh, first, that uh, Scotland could transition easily to EU membership. And we say in the book that we're sure it would get there, uh, but how long that would take and by what process is not absolutely clear. Uh, second, that the conditions of membership would be uh, uh, acceptable uh, and that uh, in particular it seems unlikely that Scotland could attain membership with all the opt-outs and uh, special deals that the UK has negotiated. And of course third, that the rest of the UK is still inside the EU as well. If Scotland remains in the UK, there will for sure be a um, serious rethink. Uh, we are moving, the UK is moving towards federalism, but it will be a, it's a rather odd federation because of the overwhelming dominance of one of the four components. Well, I think there will be uh, two potential effects. The first is that uh, both sides will have to set up negotiating teams. And both negotiating teams will have to report, support, sorry, report to the respective parliaments. Uh, the uh, Westminster Parliament will look after the interests of the rest of the UK. And the Scottish Parliament, even though it's a devolved parliament, is the only institution that can plausibly uh, be regarded as the one looking after the interests of Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Parliament will remain until 2016 uh, in majority SNP control, unless something unexpected happens. Uh, but the UK Parliament could well change six months in. So in the first six months, irreversible uh, agreement is not possible, simply. Uh, no negotiator could plausibly uh, do anything other than start clearing the ground, identifying the issues and sketching out uh, what the terms of agreement might be. But the more important political effect is that there will be a UK general election campaign uh, in the period leading up to the election, during which uh, the parties will have to secure support in the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, they are not going to secure that support by saying, and by the way, in the negotiations with Scotland, uh, we will be as generous and broad-minded as you would expect us to be. They will have to secure a mandate on the basis that they will look after the interests of the rest of the United Kingdom, principally, obviously in that case, the interests of England. Uh, so that could harden the negotiating position of a United Kingdom government. But let's hope it doesn't come to that. OK, so there's a possibility, not as strong a possibility as some commentators seem to think, but there is nevertheless a possibility that the UK Parliament elected in 2015 is Labour or Labour-led, and it would lose it it will lose its majority when the Scottish MPs depart on Scottish Independence Day. Uh, that means that the UK Fixed Term Parliaments Act uh, kicks in and there would presumably be a confidence vote after Scottish Independence Day, which the government would lose, and therefore there would be an, either a change of government or an, an out-of-sequence general election. Uh, but notice that one thing that this does is to give a further incentive to the new UK government to uh, drag its feet. I talked earlier about the incentives for the old UK government that finishes in May 2015 to drag its feet. In the scenario where the new UK government is Labour-led but, but is known in advance to lose its majority on Independence Day, uh, that gives a really strong incentive for that government to spin things out at least until after the next Scottish election in May or June 2016. Twenty third of March, twenty sixteen, is completely unrealistic. Uh, first, for the reasons we've just uh, been discussing, that the negotiations with the UK will be long, complex, and difficult, and delayed uh, by the intervention of the UK general election. Second, because the set of parallel negotiations with the EU and to, to a lesser extent uh, with others uh, are in part dependent on the outcome of the negotiations with the UK and will also be driven by their own timetables, including uh, EU treaty changes and ratification. And it's simply not practically possible to manage both the treaty changes by whatever means uh, you renegotiate the treaties 
and the ratification in all the member states in the timetable Mr Salmond has set out. It's impossible not to think uh, that that timetable is determined by the fact that he's guaranteed a majority in the Scottish Parliament until then, but not guaranteed one afterwards. Two cautions. Although all the polls show the no side ahead, uh, and a lot of the polls show the nevertheless the no's lead narrowing, um, first of all, there's a big margin of error, and poll companies differ in how they treat the don't knows or haven't made up their minds. So um, you should only, if you're looking for a trend, only look at the polls given by any one company because that one company will use the same methodology each time. Secondly, this margin of error is such that since it's three or, or three percentage points either way, six points in total can easily make the difference such that uh, if a poll is purport reporting a narrow no, the answer could easily be a narrow yes or the other way around. It's very hard to say with certainty what the outcome will be. Um, all the polling suggests that the likely uh, result is somewhere in the region of 60-40 against no. But uh, we're recording this interview uh, 58 days, I think, before the referendum. And if a week is a long time in politics, then 58 days uh, is an eternity. So a lot could happen uh, between now and then. At the moment, the Yes campaign is making a huge push for working class votes in the west of Scotland. And that is along the lines of vote yes and you will never have a Tory government again. And this has some emotional appeal. What might regard it as potentially dishonest, to use a strong word, because it's not revealing that the spending squeeze would be greater under independence than under union. But uh, at the moment, nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, working class people in the west of Scotland are less than average inclined to vote yes, and women of all regions and social classes are less inclined to vote yes than men. Well, to take a, a close yes vote, which is the only yes vote there is likely to be, um, that would be a very difficult situation. You would have a new country which, for the sake of argument, uh, had, a had the support only of a minority of its voting population. Let's say on a 75% turnout, you're a 51 or 52% yes vote. You then create a state uh, which has very severe problems of legitimacy. Uh, it's not a place I would like to be. If there's going to be a yes vote, it really ought to be uh, uh, one which uh, answered the question. Uh, in those circumstances, what does a new government have to do? Well, it has to make extreme efforts uh, to bring in all of the population to make them feel that they do have a stake in the new country, otherwise it will be unstable, and that's a very, very unhappy place to be. <laughs> well, it's, the matter is certainly not forever settled. There were 15 years between the two Quebec referendums, for instance. Uh, but I think um, referendum exhaustion will set in in the short term.